I'm Stephen Dello here on Bean Break with Blake. Indeed he is. This week our guest, as he just said, is Stephen Dello. Now Stephen, I'd say we know each other on a personal level. I'd say we're quite good friends. But that doesn't mean I know everything about you. So the interrogation starts now. So first <laughs> question, who are you? Who am I? Well, I'm Stephen Dello. Born and bred in Auckland. Grew up in most of my life in West Auckland and spent a life loving drama and theatre. How did you um, get started into the drama and theatre scene? All started at high school, really. Um, being a young, keen teenager and wanting to perform, being involved in school shows, and then got whipped away to a local theatre group called Wider Matter Little Theatre that needed a young student in some shows. And I guess that was where sort of the the taste buds got their first taste for theatre. And at 16, I decided to set up my own business in order to start offering some classes and productions because back then there just wasn't much available. Mm. Um, what was... Was your idea always to be a director and teach drama classes or did you think you'd be a performer for your whole life? No, um, I enjoyed the performing, but the idea was always to teach and then that sort of evolved into the directing. Still loved to perform, um, but yeah, the focus became far more the offstage stuff. Right. Um, as you've gotten older, would you say you uh, prefer um, watching people grow and helping them develop their skills or do you still occasionally uh, miss performing in front of people? <laughs> oh look definitely miss performing but um, love watching people grow, love passing those skills on and seeing the journey but every now and then it's nice to perform. I used to love it when we had a theatre restaurant because that was always a good outlet to perform. Hmm. So Directing shows at such a young age, was that something you were just sort of thrown into? Like, hey, we need a director, go do this. And do you think it had much of an effect on you as a person? And would you be, would you say you would be quite different now if you hadn't directed so young? Definitely. I mean, at 16, staging a full-scale musical is pretty full-on because not only is it what you see on stage, it's everything off stage. So at 16, you were learning to control budgets, ticketing, copyright, booking venues, making all that stuff happen. So I guess that's what set you in good stead for running a business. Uh, as far as from a performance point of view, you never stop learning. I mean, I learned stuff then, but I'm still learning things now. Every time you do a show, you learn something new. But yeah, it definitely kick-started it off. I've always had a great team around me from a really young age, and that's been probably a massive learning curve. Make sure you've always got the right team with you on the journey. You cannot do theatre on your own. It's impossible. It, it needs a village. Mm. And would you say you um, struggled a lot at the start, um, like directing people and possibly like directing like people who are older than you and thought, oh, why is this kid telling me what to do? <laughs> Uh, not too bad. I think, again, it's around who you put around you to surround yourself. Fake it till you make it. If you speak with confidence, people believe that this guy must know what he's saying. Uh, but very quickly, we built up a good team so people could trust us, I guess, as a brand. Yep, there's been moments along the journey that that's been hard. Uh, working with children and teenagers certainly is easier than adults. They don't challenge the same. But I do. it comes back to that team, having the good people that wrap around you. Mm. Is there anything um, you look back on in your early days of directing now and go, why did I do that? Or I would never do that these days. Oh, yeah, lots. I mean, lots of things. But it also came down to budget. You know, you, you can only do so much within a budget. Some of our best stuff we've done is on a very low budget with, you know, a whole lot of crates on stage as you sit and that's it. I think the hardest thing now is our audiences and our students, because of this world of social media, they're exposed to theatre so much through social media. They can see what's happening in Broadway, West End, etc. They expect a higher level now than they did back then. But actually we were producing some bloody good work back then, but it didn't need the flash sets, the flash lighting, because people came for what was on stage. And I think that's a little bit of a shame. You know, when we sit down now and work out, you know, what show should we do next? It would be really cool to do some real abstract, different things again. But the risk then is the audience doesn't come or the students don't sign up because they've never heard of it. Yet if you can get them in, they'll be hooked. They'll see it's a really different process. So did we make mistakes back then? Always. 
always um, and often in the technical side or perhaps casting it takes years to actually really be able to sit in an audition room, look at someone and in 30 seconds know exactly what role is suitable for them. Back then you kind of made those wrong mistakes. Um, probably the biggest mistake I ever made was casting someone in a lead role. I won't name the show because it'll give it, give it away for the poor person. They turned up at the first rehearsal and I looked and I thought, hmm, that person was on our no list. Why are they here? Turned out they had the lead role and their, per their first name was identical to someone else who got a no, but it was our mistake. So we had to honour someone who was a no right through to a lead role. Yeah, that was a learning curve. Auditions now have a lot more process admin spreadsheets to make sure that doesn't happen. They actually ended up doing really well, but it was a lot of work. Hmm. Do you think um, um, in theatre it's more so the story and the people on stage rather than the budget and the pizzazz around a show? Oh, I'd love to say yes, but I think people sometimes come for the buzz around the show, they, they, you know, I had someone say to me recently with the show I'm directing, what's your wow factor this year? And I was like, oh, bugger, I don't, you shouldn't have to have a wow factor. The wow factor should be the cast and the story and the journey we're taking you on. But that is an audience expectation that something big will happen at some point. So, yeah, I'd love to say no, but reality isn't always the same. Do you think that's changed from when you started out directing? Oh, 100%. 100%. And, and that is the world that we're in now. We're exposed to far, much, far more through television, social media, entertainment than we were. There's also big budget shows now that travel. You know, back in the day, we weren't getting these things coming to New Zealand, so you could be a little bit more experimental. That doesn't say it's not happening now. There are some great groups doing some really good stuff, and you go knowing that that's what you're going to see. Uh, but you've also got to cover your budgets. Right. So... Uh, you've just finished um, doing Greece with um, St. Peter's and Marist. Yep. Um, what was that like? Were, what were the challenges like with this show? Um, first challenge was rolling out of one show and straight into the next. So we closed the Adams family because that got moved due to COVID. And that closed in February. And literally the very next day, rehearsals began for Greece. So I learned about myself that I need a break between those. <laughs> it took me several weeks to get my head into gear there. Because of the red traffic light rules at the time, COVID meant that we needed to run under event rules rather than school rules in order to bring two schools together. So that reduced the time we could have because we couldn't rehearse straight after school. So a very tight rehearsal period, which meant a lot was relying on the last few weeks when it all comes together, when you have full days in the theatre and in the space. And we were on track for that, and then COVID hit the cast and crew, myself included. So then, one at a time, slowly wiping people out, um, made that last journey really tough, because every day s several key people were away, whether that was on stage or off stage. So that would have been a, that was a big challenge, but it was a challenge that everyone rose to. We didn't want to cancel shows. We had enough understudies, swings, and good people who could just step in. But we were definitely exhausted doing it because COVID whacks you. So you've got people arriving back after their seven days a little tired, having to step back into it. We had some people perform on final night. That was also their opening night because they'd missed the entire season. One thing it did do, though, was create that sense of buzz every night. No one ever relaxed. Often in theatre, you open your nervous opening night and then everyone relaxes in the middle. Can be when mistakes happen or the show gets a little flat and then it picks up again for final. We didn't have that. Every single night, people were nervous because there was changes and that nerves was a good thing. It, ma it made for a really tight performance. Hmm. So would you say the behind the scenes for the show especially was very different to... Um, experiences in the past you've had? Well, different in the sense of people stepping into roles they've never done before. You know, having a stage manager one day and then gone for seven the next with, you know, the choreographer and two students stepping up and taking on the stage manager's role, uh, having simple things like follow spot operators go down, having learnt the show, two dads from the cast immediately jump in and had to learn it. So um, same with cast. So yes, the backstage was different, but the show still goes on. Would the audience know? Probably not if we hadn't told them. Yeah. Mm, yeah. It was definitely different not hearing your voice at the start of a show <laughs> for once, <laughs> hearing Mr. Um, Frickers instead. Um, speaking of COVID, what, was, what were the lockdowns like for you and how did they um, affect your shows and your drama classes? Over the last few years? Over the last few years, yeah. 
The first one was really difficult and challenging. We were about to open Chess that we'd worked on for a long time. We were into just about to start final dress rehearsal. We'd, we'd done, I think, one run of Act 1 and we hadn't quite finished a run of Act 2, but we were that close to opening. So lockdown happened and there was a lot of uncertainty. I was chairperson of Marist, or am chairperson of Marist College, and obviously Marist was one of the first schools when COVID hit to to have the cases. So we were dealing with media, we were dealing with sick families, staff. There was a lot happening, because COVID was scary when it first came out. No one knew about it. So in the middle of trying to juggle a show that was due to open, I've got media knocking on my door to talk about Marist College, um, trying to you know deal with our own sort of coping around that. So first lockdown, very difficult. Our focus then turned to what we can do online to keep rehearsals going, to keep the story alive, and changing venue, changing dates. I think we moved three venues, four dates in a matter of months, but we still managed to stage it. Limited people got to see it, which was a real shame. Um, second lot of lockdowns, again, we are impacting shows, but by then we started to know how to do it. So Zoom became far better. We were able to rehearse nearly an entire production line-wise on Zoom, singing one-on-one, obviously group singing in the internet's not a good thing. <laughs> so we, we got there. But there's a different balancing because you're balancing students that are loving being on Zoom and being engaged, students like yourself that absolutely <laughs> hate being on Zoom, um, staff that are that, and, and there was Zoom fatigue, you know, I have a daytime job and a lot of that is teaching on Zoom. So there were days I was clocking up 13 to 14 Zoom sessions in a day. Your head at the end of it was huge. Um, and certainly in that first lockdown, on top of that, dealing with, you know, a crisis happening in the school that you're chair of. So, yeah, it was a little crazy. Mm. Um, would you say um, having to do so many Zoom classes, has that um, impacted and changed any way you teach in person? <laughs> you love the moments you're back in person, definitely. I think the thing that's changed us in person at the moment is the masks. Theatre is all about expression. And you've immediately covered up half a person's expression by having to have a mask on in classes and rehearsals. And when people started getting sick at Greece, you know, we had to all mask up again. And that's difficult. So less, less the Zoom. I think Zoom taught us how to do rehearsals better. I found the classes still difficult. Classes are hard to engage on Zoom. We got there, and I'm really proud of our team for keeping it going. But rehearsals, I think we got better and better at managing Zoom. But when you come back face-to-face, it's fantastic, but I can't wait to hopefully a day that masks are just not required. Mm. Do you see that day being this year Mm. or next year? Anytime soon? Not anytime soon, no. I mean, if you look at what's just happened, and I talked to three other directors in the last 24 hours, and all of them are, have got kids or, or adults sick with COVID, and their shows that are all opening in the next few weeks, everyone has to mask up, or, or the risk is too high. So I think we're in for this for a while yet. Mm. Were you um, scared or concerned when things started to open up um, after COVID, after the various lockdowns and theatre shows could start happening? Were you scared that you were going to have to cancel more dates or were you just excited to be back in person? Oh, excited to be back. And I think we relaxed. We we went from having to deal with this red traffic light scenario and all the, the rules and regulations around that, which was hard for the arts and the entertainment world, to suddenly the doors are open, you can let everyone in. And what we didn't think about was, of course, we can all still get sick. So suddenly we were excited, the tickets were coming in, everything was full systems go, and then we had our first person get sick. And we're like, oh, okay, hopefully that doesn't spread around, and it did. And I think we relaxed too much too quickly. Yeah, mm. we would be a lot stricter around our rat testing, around mask use, sanitising, etc., for the next production, knowing that it can still hit you. So what's the next show coming up for you? Um, Blood Brothers is the next one that I'm directing. That's on in September at the Playhouse Theatre in Glen Eden, um, which is a mixture of teenagers and adults working together. It's um, one of my favourite musicals, so... Yeah, a few weeks break, and then we get stuck into that one. Are you looking forward to it? Do you think you'll be excited from the word go because you love the show so much? Definitely, and having a few weeks out between shows is definitely going to help. Um, but Blood Brothers, I've directed once before and did it and wanted to do it again. Last time I did it in Theatre in the Round style, so audience seated, seated in a circle in the show in the middle. Really cool, really awesome. This time a bit more traditional, and I'm looking forward to to playing with that. Um, Blood Brothers is one of those stories that you will laugh your way through Act 1. 
cry your way through act two. So, uh, you know, if you if we can get that impact on our audience, then I know it's successful. So, yeah, really looking forward to it. What would you say your um, best and worst moment on stage have been? <laughs> worst moment on stage, I was a young kid in Roald Dow's The Twits. And I flew in as a bird and made a big dramatic entrance and didn't spot a leak on the floor and went flying ass up. This bird died. Opening scene on the floor. Um, second time bad one was getting laryngitis when I was um, playing Oliver and Oliver and had done again all the work and then losing your voice. We still performed every night, but songs had to be changed. And yeah, that was hard. Um, best performances on stage. Ooh, that's a tough one. Um... Ironically, actually, probably I was involved with applied theatre consultants for many, many years and we created a piece of work that looked at family violence and gave children and teenagers a, a safe space to talk about what goes on in their homes, the good, the bad and the ugly. And we performed that for th 13 years all over the country and, in fact, in several places in the world. And I think... Every day, knowing the impact that made was probably right up there as a performance highlight. But performing it around the world in some cool universities was pretty special too. Um, for myself personally, the theatre restaurants were always the fun ones. Uh, give me a theatre restaurant any day where you've got an audience drinking way too much alcohol and you can pretty much tell them to do anything. We were once in the little town of Pyro and we had a two-hour show. And these, this audience was filled. This racing race course, the Pyro Races, was our venue. And we would have had 300 people in this theatre restaurant all being fed, getting drunker and drunker as the night went on. We could literally tell them to do anything. And I remember at one point in the night, one of the teams said to me, try and get them all up on the tables. So we got them all up on the tables, dancing the La Bamba. Probably these days a health and safety concern, but we got away with it back then. And I can remember getting to midnight going, how are we actually going to end the show? No one wants to leave. We could not come up with a way to get these people out. So we set the fire alarm off. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh the things you could do back then. Yes, yes. <laughs> do you miss um, not having as much freedom, I guess, and health and safety being more of a thing these days? Yes and no. I mean, it needs to be there. You know, nothing worse than, than someone getting harmed. Have we gone to the ultimate extreme? Absolutely. You know, having to have handrails both sides of stairs and things, you know, we, we are smart enough people to know which way to walk up and down a stair well and to block it. So I think we've gone probably too far, um, but there's been some accidents around the world in the theatre space, so we do need to look after our performers. So I totally get it and support it. Uh, but, yeah, we, we definitely we pushed boundaries, but probably... Less so on stage, it was more the stuff you would do off. It was not unusual to take a group on tour and like Pyro, a camp out in the racing grounds with sleeping bags and things. Nowadays, there'd be a million rules around how you'd have to do that and make sure everyone's, you know, got their own bathrooms and all that. You just mucked in. You know, I grew up in an age that boys, girls, adults, kids, we walked into a green room, we quickly got dressed, we jumped on stage for our next costume change. No one needed separate spaces and all of that. And I get the, the need for it and the safety for it now. But it was a different era you just did it no one ever thought about it and it was never I never ever felt unsafe it's just the world of theatre and everyone moved at great speed you did your thing and got back on but things have people have ruined that space that is now meant safety is you know very important and I 100% support it um, but yeah there was something cool back in those days of everyone just mucking in mm. would you say that we um will ever go back um with health and safety wise or do you think no. where we are is where we are I think we've got the mix right now. I hope we don't go any more overboard. Um, I think I think it's there. What we're now looking at as a theatre industry in New Zealand is how we treat our performers and our team and our volunteers. So there's a real move at the moment to be making sure we're, we're treating them in a safe way, a respectful way that they are volunteers and making sure that that side is well looked after, that people can come into your space and feel really safe, have someone to talk to if something goes wrong uh, and making sure that everyone is being respected and I really support the theatre industry. I mean there's been some horror stories around the world, we don't want to go down that path so we want to make sure that there isn't a bullying culture happening in, in theatre which is really s sad to hear that it does because it's against everything theatre stands for, which should be teamwork. Hmm. Um, so going back to Kids for Drama, um, 
Originally, I know that wasn't its original name. Um, why did you decide to start Stephen's Dramatics um, 30 Stephen years Dallow ago? Stephen Dramatics. Yeah, I don't know why that name came up. I think it was just we needed something on a business form really quickly. Um, I saw a need for community classes because there wasn't anything for me to do. So in West Auckland, there was just nothing at the time. Um, I had great support from Penny and the team at Waitakere Council to set up in a local community centre. We ran out of a number of different venues. Um, so the, Stephen Dallow Dramatics just kind of was born out of it. Uh, a good little while into it, a group from Skids, Safe Kids and Daily Supervision, which is a well-known franchise now, approached us and said, look, why don't we team up together and look at doing something in that after-school space, uh, but we might need to change the name. So Kids for Drama was born. We also set up Kids for Art, Kids for Music, Kids for Dance, but only the drama carried on. Um, and over time, we sort of separated from Skids and did our own thing, but uh, kindly kept the name. Hmm. Um, do you think definitely in the early days it was helpful having a team around you to help teach classes? Do you think you could have done it by yourself at such a young age? Well, so for the first several years it was just me. Then we brought in Natalie was number two. So there was a couple of us in those early days. Then we actually grew really big. We had classes all over Auckland, Wellington, New Plymouth, Sydney, and we went crazy. And we had lots of staff. But the problem is, it was all part-time work. Our classes are after school. And most of our staff tend to come from the acting world. And the second Peter Jackson had a new film out, everyone wanted to go and audition for that. So keeping good staff was hard because they would leave regular employment for that one-off filming opportunity that they were waiting for. So all of a sudden, we actually went, let's can all of that and scaled it right back to the basics of just a couple of venues, small team again, and do it well. Mm. Um, so apart from Kids for Drama, what else do you do with your time in your life, in your week? <laughs> How long have you got? Well, first and foremost, Dad. Dad to two two wonderful girls, so that keeps you out of mischief. My day job at Barfoot and Thompson is managing training and recruitment for their property management side. So I look after a team of trainers and a team of staff who deal with the rental side of real estate. So that's a very busy full-on and exciting job with a company that supports me doing all these other crazy things. I co-host with Emma Kickarts, which is a weekly radio show on a Sunday night that chats to people up and down the country about the arts scene in New Zealand. Also do a podcast and weekly show called Property Matters. It's just on a break at the moment, but that's um, in the investment workspace. I'm board chair of uh, Maris College. I'm board chair of the Blockhouse Bay Community Centre, uh, involved in a number of different organisations in different ways. Uh, but yeah, I like to keep busy. Definitely a busy person. So with a day job in real estate and then running Kids for Drama and then also doing Kick Arts, I, I'd say th uh, those are two pretty different worlds. Um, how do they coexist and <laughs> do they ever clash in your world? They don't clash. There's probably times at work that they know I'm doing a show because I'm tired and more grumpy than normal. Uh, but they, they've always been very supportive. I think I've really found my niche at Barfoot and Thompson. I, I, over the years, have had jobs in the theatre space during the day, but they often then clash with you doing your, your kids' or drama stuff because of everything happens at night and weekends. So landing this amazing job gives me a chance to have an outlet. I'm training, I'm teaching during the day. Yes, it's real estate, not theatre, um, but they're very dramatic lessons, trust me. Um, and in a company whose values sit really well with me, it's all about community, family, diversity, and trust and integrity. And couldn't wish for better company to sit in with those values. So it doesn't really clash. I use my annual leave wisely when it's showtime, and that, that's when I take my leave. They always laugh at work and say, what holiday are you off to this time? Like, no, 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 directing a show. It's show week. Sorry, guys. Um, but it works. It sits really well. It sits together. It's got a nice synergy. Hmm. When you used to have a day job in theatre, then it would also be doing kids for drama things. Would it just be too much? Do you like having Barfoot as just a break from theatre? Yeah, it is a nice mental switch. But also, when you were doing two lots of theatre, it was more that than everything clashed for weekends. You know, theatre rehearsals in the weekends. Mm. So if you're doing a day job, then they're paying you. Obviously, they want you available the weekends. Plus, you've got your own drama and community groups that you're running. So it was really the weekend clashes. We're working in, in Barford and Thompson. It's, it's a Monday to Friday job. So I can get creative on the weekend. <laughs> 
And so how did Kick Arts come about? How did you and Emma take over hosting that? So Kick Arts has been run by Richard Green for about eight years. And um, he wasn't too well a couple of years ago and sort of sent a message out individually, actually, to both Emma and I and said, would this be something that you'd be interested in hosting? And I didn't reply to him straight away, and neither did Emma, and I sent a message to Emma saying, hey, I've just had this message from Richard Green. I don't know that I'd want to do this on my own, but why don't we tag tag team together? Her and I have worked together for many, many years. I trust Emma really well, and working together knew we would get the job done, but also then the pressure's not on one person. She cracked up laughing and said, I'm just mid-texting you the exact same message because he'd just contacted. So we took it on. We've changed the landscape of what it is. It's it's very much now a national programme rather than just Auckland. While it goes out on Planet FM in Auckland, it is the podcast that's downloaded and available across the country. And thanks to Zoom and technology and phones, you know, we're able to chat to people all over New Zealand, in fact, all over the world. We've had some great international guests as well. So, yeah, I really love it. It's, it's you know, as you're experiencing, it's, there's nothing better than a bit of live radio and doing that's my you, my performance, I guess. You said, am I still performing? Every Sunday night at 8 o'clock, it feels like a performance. Mm. And um, I know that uh, somehow I know, because I'm on the inside, uh, that you guys are still currently on Zoom. Um, what are your thoughts and feelings on that? And are you... Like excited and just want to get back in the studio on our yeah, Sunday night. Yeah, absolutely. So Planet FM was part of the Unitech grounds in Carrington Road, which has been sold and demolished to build thousands of apartments for uh, our government, a part of the Kiwi Build scheme, which unfortunately didn't align with the new studio being ready because COVID delayed all the equipment arriving from overseas. So we've been a long time in Zoom. I'm completely over it. Emma is so motivated to keep this going. If it was me, I'd probably have gone on a break, but she's like, no, we can't, we must keep going. So we keep interviewing, but um, we do it on Zoom on a Sunday night and pre-record for the following week. Uh, So we've still got an element of live, but I love having all our guests in one room, around the table, bit of Graham Norton style without the wine, having a great old conversation. We've lost that on Zoom. There's short interviews that then need to be edited together, which Emma does. So, yeah, I can't wait. They're now saying middle of July, so that seems a long way away, but it's at least getting closer. Closer bit by bit. Yeah. <laughs> um. So... Who inspires you? Are your inspirations now different to what they were 10 years ago? And do you get inspired from different art forms, not just the theatre world? Good question. Um, Years ago, my inspiration started with Paul Norell. He's a very well-known New Zealand actor, and he was my music teacher at Liston College. At Liston, we didn't have drama or any of the arts back then. Um, Music was as close as you could get. But he brought the shows into the school and started doing things and he played Fagin when I did Oliver so working next to him was was such an inspiration Uh, I then at Wider Matter Theatre had two wonderful um, people that sort of took me under their wing, Um, two by the name of Dorothy, Dorothy uh, Walker at Wider Matter Theatre and Dorothy Chisholm at Playhouse and both of them sort of said right we're going to train you, teach you, send you off onto courses, which I did with the wonderful Joy Stoneman and Raymond Hawthorne. Um, so at young ages to be exposed to these amazing people. So I, I looked up and I guess my inspiration came from people that trusted and put things into me. Uh, these days my inspiration is far more the kids in front of me. There's something about you get to an age that actually instead of looking for the wider, it's like it's right there in front of you. Why Why keep searching? I'm inspired by the kids who rock up every week. They have things going on in their own personal life but can still turn out an amazing show on stage. They become your inspiration every single day. So, yes, it's changed. It's changed probably from your mentor to the ones you're mentoring. Mm. Speaking of those um, kids, I ran around drama the other week and asked for some questions from people. Um, they were dangerous? Were, they, yeah, it was so dangerous. I got um, too many questions that we had to unfortunately say no to. But um, these will all be kept anonymous because... Um, then they, I can guess them, though. I, there's, there's a chance you'll be able to guess them. <laughs> so... Um, This first one actually isn't from a drama person. Um, But what is your least favourite show other than Hamilton and why? (laughs) Ooh. Singing in the Rain. Definitely. Um, I don't know. I just, 
I've seen it a couple of times and both times fallen asleep. Um, I have to admit I fell asleep in a chorus line in West End, which was really embarrassing because I was in the middle row, slept right through it until the curtain call and woke up applauding and then realised actually I must have slept through interval and people would have had to walk over me to get in and out of the seats. Um, some of those real cheesy American ones, they just don't do it for me. They don't at all. And I think it's just, I want stories that are going to move me. They've either got to make me laugh or cry or like Greece probably doesn't make you laugh or cry, but the music takes you on a journey. Um, so if it's not going to tick those boxes, they sit in the worst, but sorry guys, singing in the rain. Um, Hamilton, sorry, it's still up there. Where does, where does the hatred from Hamilton come from? Um, I just haven't clicked to the music apart from a couple of great songs. I've watched act one. Just, it just, again, just didn't do it for me. Mm. But but perhaps not a fan of his style of writing because I'm not a great fan of In the Heights either. Um, it's just a style that, that just doesn't click. Right. And sort of going off of that, what are things you look for in a good show and a show that you love and then things that uh, in a bad show that you don't love as much? What are good things and bad things? When you're reading a script, you want to keep reading. So if you're really busy, you need to be able to pick up a script and go, I'm not, I don't want to put this down. And if after 10 minutes you've read it, you're like, oh, okay, I'm going to cook the dinner now, whatever, you, that's not going to tick the box. So if you're not hooked into it to direct it, you will not do a good job of it. You should never direct something that you've got no interest or passion in doing. And I have turned down shows before for that reason. I just, you know, there's a couple of times I've been asked to direct High School Musical. It doesn't do it for me. And it wouldn't do, I wouldn't do justice then to the cast that are all excited to do it. And I get there'll be cast thoroughly excited to do it as they would to do Hamilton. Uh, you've got to have enough excitement in the story to come up with your own vision. Otherwise, you will just turn out something that everyone's seen before because that's the only thing in your brain. I could do Blood Brothers probably 10 times and do it 10 different ways because there's so many different ways in my head that I'd love to try. And that should be where you sit. Mm. Is this something you learnt from uh, experience or was it something you were told? No, I learnt from experience. Um, Definitely, there's been, you know, used to be part of theatre groups where you had no choice. This is the show that you know like to direct and you do it because it's good experience. Um, but then you do the one you love and you think, why, why did I do that last one? It just didn't move it for me. Your energy has to be infectious. It has to pass on to the people you're working with. And bearing in mind, I mainly work with children and teenagers. So, you know, they feed off that. If you've got no interest in it, they're going to also feed off that. Mm. Yeah. Another question. Uh, how do you keep so motivated in times where you have no motivation? And how do you keep others around you motivated in those times also? Barocca. It's an amazing product. Um, <laughs> Not sponsored. Yeah, anyone who sees me. No, actually, I, I do the cheap Health Rees brand. It's half the price. Um, keeping motivated. It is hard sometimes. But I guess, again, when you've got a room full of people... You know, it would be like me walking in here today. If you went into it, the moment you've turned that mic on, you've got no choice. You've got to do it. And um, it's exactly the same. I have turned up to rehearsals feeling completely low, tired, not well. Suddenly, there's 100 people sitting on stage. I mean, last week I went to a rehearsal, literally sort of my first day out of isolation. I probably shouldn't have turned up. I was pretty unwell. And I got there and everyone was talking to me and I was like, oh, I'm not going to last long. But the moment you have 100 kids in front of you, you just turn it on. You become the actor. So the motivation comes, again, from the amazing people in front of you. Um, I guess it's also cutting yourself some slack and knowing that it's okay at times to not be able to push 100%, but that's when your team kicks in. I work with people that I can turn to and say to my musical director or choreographer, today's not a good day, I need you to really take the lead for me today, and then they can turn another day and go, hey, I'm a bit, a bit tired today, and you know, you share that responsibility out. Hmm. Do you like working with the same people, same choreographers, same musical directors for every show, or do you like switching it up and working with different people? Uh, I guess you want to work with people you trust, you know, and I've had the same musical director for a number of years now because I 100% trust her and what she gets out of her young band matches the same ethos that I have for what we get out of our students. So I feel, I feel very trusting in that space. We're bringing in um, for Blood Brothers a different vocal coach this time. I've never worked with, I've known her for years, but to someone new, um, a different choreographer's coming in for that. So we do have that mix, um, but there are certain... Certain shows to suit certain people. You know, Quinn, our choreographer for Greece, he's he's a dancer, man. You know, he's he's in his early twenties and the kids feed off him. So if it's a big dance show, you absolutely want him. But a show that's more perhaps 
movement and clever sort of interactive stuff, that might be a waste of his skills. So you would pick somebody else. So I'm not opposed to different people. I love working with them as long as I trust them. Um, over the years, you know, you, you fall out with some because theatre is a pretty emotional space. Um, I'm not going to lie. Uh, there, there's people in my creative team, you know, they, we might still be friends on Facebook. I'm not sure they may have defriended me. And that's just theatre too, you know. It, you get really emotional and tired and it's massive. But uh, once you find those people you connect with, you definitely try and use them as much as possible. Do you find if you have fallen out with someone in the, I guess, New Zealand theatre industry, do you find that it's like quite small and you end up bumping into them? Well, I find I end up now interviewing them on kickouts, which has been hilarious. It's just, I haven't fallen out with too many people in my life, but there's been a few. And I've had to chuckle when they end up on kickouts back in front of me with a microphone, but I'm asking the questions. Uh, so that's, that's entertaining. Yeah. Mm. And our last question, um, what is your stance on LGBTQ rights and the idea that um, all theatre kids are queer? <laughs> queer in a good way. We're all queer. We're all strange. That's, if you take that meaning, that's, yeah. that's what theatre's all about. Um, theatre needs to be for everybody. It needs to be an inclusive space. And I think we've worked really hard. We're still learning in that space. And... You know, I'm of an older generation where it was as a teacher walking in and going, right, boys to the right, girls to the left, let's do this game, da 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 da. And I've had to learn that everyone's identity has developed, that we have, not that it wasn't there then, but it just wasn't talked about and it just didn't happen. Now it is so much more a safe, inclusive environment. I want to celebrate that. So I think we need to be saying that everyone is queer depends on your meaning of that word but I think we need to be inclusive people need to feel they can bring who they are into that theatre space I want people to feel safe to be who they are but that also comes with some awkwardness of when you are staging productions that were written 30, 40, 50 years ago. And we have these massive casting discussions now around making sure that everyone feels safe in the identity that they are as a person, but then does that identity match the role they're going to play on stage? And if we change that to allow that, does that then change the storyline that was written 30 or 40 years ago? So as a director, I have to make a stance and go, am I trying to recreate the original if so, this is how those roles might need to sit and that might not work for everyone? Or is this a show we can really bring to this modern world and celebrate that? And I think we need to feel okay to do both. Mm. It can't always necessarily be one or the other, but there is times where actually, if we're going to celebrate history, history looked like this on stage. In Greece, Danny and Sandy are the iconic characters. They need to play in that way but there's so many other pieces of theatre that we can go actually no let's throw that out the box and really mix it up so as a director I want to find that balance and making sure I'm choosing theatre that supports all of our students um, regardless of who they identify as and I encourage our students to teach the adults um, you know we've had several students over the last couple of years talk to me, say things to me around how they feel un uncomfortable or comfortable on different scenarios. We're learning too. And we live in this world of social media that, you know, everything goes out and we have all these conversations. Just remember your adults grew up in a different time. So feel safe to talk to them. Let them know when they're getting it right, not just when they're getting it wrong. Mm. And that will help that theatre space become even more inclusive. Yeah. Do you think um, that... Uh people getting offended at um, older people for not getting it right 100% uh, of the time or accidentally slipping up by, say, misgendering someone. Do you think that's wrong and people should, like, allow for people to remember things like that? I'm not saying that it's wrong. I think a gentle reminder is important, but mm. the word there is gentle because they may not have even clicked that they've said it. I can stand in a class today and still say boys one side, girls the other, because I have done that for 30-something years. Mm. Um, that doesn't mean any disrespect. I've just It's just come out of the mouth. And often as soon as you say it, you go, oh, I've really mucked this up. Um, and, and you regret it. If you're looking at a script and you're holding a book, there's a high chance if that show was written 20 years ago, it's going to say male voices sing this line, female voices sing this line. So it's very easy. Again, when you've got that in front of you, you're reading things out so no offense ever intended I encourage people to then say hey here's a different way of saying it because sometimes we're just not sure about getting that language right it's about the language I don't think it means that that person is any less inclusive 
they just haven't learnt the language correct. Mm. So help them out with suggestions rather than telling them off. Because when we do that, the opposite happens. We get nervous as adults of getting it wrong that we then muck it up or we close off completely. So I encourage students to say, hey, here's an idea. When you get to that bit, obviously in the book it says this, here's some really good language we can use around it to make sure our group's inclusive. Love hearing suggestions. Hmm. And would you say um, theatre has become more inclusive um, now than when you started? And would you say bullying is less of a problem now than it was when you started? Or would you say it's a different kind of bullying? (sighs) Do you know what? My memory of all my theatre when I was a teenager and a young adult was 100% inclusive. I can't recall any bullying. The bullying happened at school. That was in a different space. You were bullied for being in the theatre and in the theatre space and not out on the rugby field. I grew up in a family of rugby players, every single one of them. And here's this guy, you know, prancing around the stage. Um, But I never felt unsafe. Uh, People knew very well everybody's sexuality and sexual preference Um, probably identity wasn't a word used back then but certainly uh, you know people's sexual preference was very clear and that was accepted and a hundred percent safe but what happened is it stopped the moment you walked out the door and that was sad so you would be in this beautiful safe space and you'd watch all these wonderful relationships form over a over a show and the second they walked out into their community so much of that had to go back to what was seen as normal now I think they walk out of space and it continues. Mm. It's safe to do so. We, Our society has moved in so many leaps and bounds and that is fantastic. I don't, th- I don't see bullying in the theatre space that I'm involved in and I don't tolerate it. And if it's there, it needs to go. Um, and I have removed people if I feel that that is happening, whether that's an adult or a student. People need to speak up. They need to feel safe to come and talk. Sometimes it's just a misinterpretation or a misunderstanding, so trust the adult to sort it out for you. Um, but I've always found theatre to be inclusive. I can't remember ever being in a, in a setting where it wasn't. The outside world, however, would look at it differently. What does the future hold for Steve Adello after Blood Brothers, or is that just unknown? <laughs> At this stage, it sort of feels like it's ticking in a nice space. A couple of years ago, I decided to, I, not say call it quits, but just pause. I, um, I don't know. I was just in a space, and, and, and we were in an interesting time with the group that we had and the people, and I just felt like I needed to step away, probably for a few years and let others take the lead. And then just a few people changed and shifted, changed, and... Um, I didn't actually end up fully stepping away and I'm glad I didn't because it was almost enough to just rebirth you back into it. So I'm feeling in a really comfortable space at the moment. Um, I'm loving the day job that I have. I love turning up to work. I love the fact that I can do what I'm doing after hours and have a salary during the day because to be honest, the biggest stress of trying to do theatre is paying the bills. Um, Theatre comes and goes. It runs at a loss 90% of the time. So you've got to have a full paying job in order to do what you love. So I'm feeling comfortable at the moment tracking it where it is. So no major future plans. I am. I have my moments of feeling older than I want to be. And I don't know if I can articulate that correctly. But so there's times of, oh, well, I have to shift what I'm doing or who I am because of my age. And then I have other times that I go, nah, stuff, it doesn't matter. Just make a fool of yourself like you usually do. Who Mm. cares? Um, And again, that depends on the safety of the people you're around and working with. If anything, the older you get, the more you are fussier around who you have in your space. And would you say that's a good thing? Definitely. Definitely. You want people that you can trust, people that you can be silly with, have your fun with, ask the tough questions with, have those discussions around being inclusive, etc., cetera, and, and feel really safe in that space. Mm. If you had to give a younger version of yourself um, a piece of advice or something you'd do differently, what would that be? Pay your taxes, because in Land Revenue you do know where you live. Um, look after those who look after you. Don't, f- don't forget to keep saying thank you. Um, I think if I looked back... Now I would love, sadly, some have passed away. You know, I'd love to take them out for dinner and say, do you realise the impact you made on my life? Um, and, and I think my, uh, I'd tell my younger self to be really looking after that team so well. If you're in it for the money, arts is not for you. It's got to be something that you're passionate about. Find the other job that ticks the, the money box and 
you know, do what you love. What would you say to um, young directors out there who want to get started? Learn every bit of theatre before you direct. So be an actor, a stage manager. Learn how to do props. Go and rig some lights and do the lighting. Make sure you know how the sound works. Um, Help build the set, do the pack-in. Make the cups of tea for the production team. Sit in on the meetings about casting before you try and direct. The more you know about theatre, the better director you will be. Um, Yes, I directed young, but then I stepped out and went and did all those other things. I was rigging lights for Zytec Lighting at Sky City in the small hours of the morning. Uh, I was stage managing dance shows at a very young age. I helped create props and set for a show. You you need to know all of those bits before you're a director because then you appreciate everything your team is doing to pull that show together. I do watch young directors come in very bossy. They think they're there to just direct the talent on stage and then all the other bits will just slip into place. They might. They might still put on a really good show, but I bet you if they turn around at the end of the day, none of that team's there for the second show. They do one and one only. So, yeah, have a good sounding knowledge of everything. Get as much practical experience as you can Um, try directing for a bit, then step out again, go and do something else, come back, come in and out. Yeah. If you weren't directing, what other um, position would you like to be involved in in theatre if you couldn't direct or perform? Direct or perform, you know what I mean? Um, Lighting or front of house? Um, I love managing the front of house. I've always loved that. Love my show to start on time, organising the people in and out. Um, that's become challenging. Our front of house teams in New Zealand have worked so hard over COVID with all the restrictions. Full credit to them having to socially distance audience that have booked prior to it happening. Um, and lighting, I love. There's something creative about lighting, bringing that to life. Um, I enjoy sort of the design and the operating. I'm probably well past climbing up the ladders, though. <laughs> Well, now that you have um, sat in the lovely box and been interviewed, uh, who would you want to hear on the show? Ooh. Realistically. Oh, so not Elton John? Okay. Unfortunately, no. Maybe one day. Um, Jennifer Ward Leland. Jennifer Ward Leland is this just beautiful person that epitomises what theatre should be as, as a director, a producer and a performer. But she also celebrates so beautifully New Zealand. Um, her tereo is out of this world and both her and her husband, Michael Hurst, who's a very well-known performer, um, have just lived and breathed theatre. And if Jennifer is in the room or in your space, um, you know you've got a royal a royalty of New Zealand theatre in your room, um, but she will be the most humble person to interview as well. Hmm. There we go. There's my name for the day. (laughs) Awesome. And where can people um, find you or find things you're up to? Sure. Kids for Drama. Head to kidsfordrama.com, numeric number four. Uh, You'll find us on Facebook and Instagram. And if you want to join Barfoot and Thompson and get a good career in property management, check out barfoot.co.nz. Awesome. Stephen, thank you so much for coming on the show. Cool. Thanks for having me.